My guest today is Dr. Roger Cohen. Roger is an advisor to BetaShares, a Sydney-based exchange-traded fund ETF provider with a focus on product development. Roger was previously managing director at Deutsche Bank, Sydney and London, where he ran the Europe, Middle East and Africa Index Trading Desk and was involved from inception with the launch of the highly successful Deutsche Bank Bank X Trackers ETF platform. Roger was also at Macquarie Bank, where he was involved in building the global index swap and Delta One trading capability. Roger is currently also a lecturer at the University of Sydney. Roger, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Good morning, Robert, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Let's get straight into it super quickly, Roger. In 30 seconds or less, what is an ETF or an exchange traded fund? Very simply, an ETF is really just a wrapper, which you can buy on the market like a normal share. You can buy and sell it. And inside that wrapper will be a whole package of things. So there might be a, a basket of shares. For example, the, the AA200 is 200, 200 stocks in the Australian index. NASDAQ, you can buy the whole NASDAQ. So all those shares are put into this wrapper. And then you as an investor can just go ahead and buy and sell that whole package like a single some share. And what we evolved from, from having to buy those 200 shares, Roger, if you could buy the 200 shares to replicate the Australian market, we've evolved from having bought the shares to then buying um, managed funds and unitized structures. Um, and it seems as though the evolution is now moving towards uh, exchange traded funds where access to um, markets, not only domestically, but globally, is becoming uh, as easy as it has ever been and cheaper than it has ever been. That's absolutely correct. I think of ETFs in a way like going into a supermarket. You know, you go into your supermarket and you can buy milk or bread or vegetables. With ETFs, it's the same thing. If you want to buy a country or a, a, a theme like, a, you know, robotics or pharmacy, or if you want fixed income or property, whatever asset class you want, it's just a supermarket item. You go into your ETF provider and you just take those ETFs off the shelves. There's a lot of skeptics out there, Roger. What do you think is the biggest myth about ETFs right now that you would just love to unpack and debunk? I think the two myths I would like to debunk, one, one is around liquidity. So often people think you know ETFs are not liquid, they don't trade. ETFs are hugely liquid because the underlyings that make them up are liquid. So even, even if you don't see a lot of liquidity on screen or when you're trading, behind them is just a, you know, a tower of liquidity. And the second thing I want to debunk is some people think, you know, I'm buying something that's, that's um, you know, dangerous or obscured. You're not. You're just buying a bunch of securities that have been put nicely into a, it's like a bag of potatoes. You're just buying a bunch of potatoes. The ETF is just like the bag that holds them. So they, the things inside them are you know, exactly what you see. They're transparent, they're liquid. Why do you think people are skeptical about what they're actually buying, that they might be speculative or, or whatnot? Why are, they, why are they skeptical? I think that over time, they're becoming less and less skeptical, sorry about that, because they, they're realizing that there is a, a plastic bag and they can see through it and they can see what's inside. So I think skepticism will just start declining as ETFs become more and more widespread, more mainstream and um, you know, more education, more people are educated about them. I've never thought about it as a bag of potatoes, uh, Roger. I, I might use that analogy next time I'm speaking with someone when describing ETFs. Now, beta shares, um, you guys are, a, a, in my, from my research, um, uh, leaders in ETF uh, products and as a provider of ETFs to uh, the Australian market. Uh, I believe that, that you currently have in excess of 50 ETFs, uh, Roger. Um, and if you're not the leader, I don't know who he is because BlackRock iShares have around 35, Vanguard, I don't believe have anywhere near. And I understand that you are also uh, probably number three in assets under management with around 13 or so billion dollars in um, money managed through exchange traded funds. How do you 
come up with there's in excess of 50 ETFs. How do you come up with the, the next ETF? Do, do you sit around the boardroom table on a whiteboard coming up with different ideas and concepts? Like what goes into the, the process of coming up with a new concept for investors to, to gain access to? I, I guess, I mean, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And one of the things we do is we encourage everyone in BetaShares to participate in those discussions. But a lot of what we get is from the external world. So if we're talking to people like you, talking to you know, clients and end users, and then I'll go back to my supermarket analogy. It's like you're walking into a supermarket. You want to see the shelves full. So we, we kind of look, where's, where's there a place where the shelves are not, you know, are empty or sparse? And then that, that's where we'll focus. That's where there's room for a new product. So we, we, we try and fill, you know, we, we've tried to create building blocks that cover all the different places you go. So wherever you are in the supermarket, there'll be a, an appropriate product. How do you maintain a level of quality control whereby you have an environment where you can spark really good debate, really good ideas and have transparent and honest conversations around the boardroom table? What happens when there's a good idea and not everybody agrees or what happens when there's just a totally crazy idea that people are pushing that you just see this is not going to work how do you how do you manage that conversation and how do you go from an idea to then building that and making that available for end, end investors yeah well the, the best ideas are the ones that can get contested so um typically you want to you know if someone comes with an idea you don't want to shoot them down, but you want to try and poke holes in the idea because if it's if it's going to survive, it's got to be yeah. Someone if we don't poke holes in it, someone else is going to. So um, that's kind of how we work. And I think yeah, I always think about it. If I say something and people are, are attacking it or poking holes in it, they're doing it in my idea, not in me. And I think that's the that's the sort of culture that that we try to encourage. It sounds like there's an environment and culture and atmosphere that is. Um, supportive uh, and it's more so uh, debating the idea and um, you know the old saying goes uh, play the ball not the man and if you can maintain that sort of um, analogy if you like around the boardroom table then you'd like to think that um, some great ideas would would come out of that yeah but the ideas come it's not just the boardroom table you have to get out in the world and talk to people so you know doing things like this where you know, someone who's listening may have an idea, they may send us an email, uh, you know, we may have a conversation, you may have a conversation with someone and come back to us and say, what about X? And, you know, we'll, we'll definitely take that on board and look at it. And, you know, of course, we get a lot more ideas than end up as products, but that's good. How do you, how do you manage the hype, Roger, when it comes to a particular investment or a particular asset class um, tech has been one that um, has been getting a lot of media headlines lately, but tech has been going on and on for, for a very long time. And if you look back in history, um, technology stocks kind of have bigger booms, bigger busts, far more volatile, but have been on a quite an upward trajectory since, since the mid nineties. Um, but notwithstanding that there is, there, there does become hype. Uh, and, you know, there's the old saying that when, the taxi driver is giving you stock tips, then it's probably a good time to get out of the stock market. How do you respond to someone who says, Roger, you've just come out with the, the NASDAQ 100 ETF. Uh, the fact that an ETF manufacturer and provider has put something together now, do you know what? I think it's time to get out of that because the market's hot. Everyone's producing products for it now. And that's not a market that you want to be in. How do you respond to, to that? Look, I, I respond by saying most of the ETFs we put out are not a knee-jerk reaction. So the life cycle is you know, anywhere from months to years. There are some ETFs which have been on our back burner for several years. And every, every time we have a product development meeting or something, they come to the fore and we go, no, the time's not right or it's too new or too untested. And some are, you know, some are much more obvious. So we don't, we don't do things knee-jerk. We do products that we think will have a you know have longevity, and we have products that we think people will use. So, for example, our you know our geared and our bear funds, they're not necessarily 
although I sometimes think the gear should be, they're not necessarily long-term products, but at times when you want to have, you know, hedge your exposures, a bear fund is a great instrument to do it because when the markets go down, it will perform, but it's certainly not something, you know, over time markets go up. So I'd be mad and anyone would be mad to want that as part of their portfolio permanently. So we, we design things for different needs. We've got core products, we've got thematic exposures, um, and then we've got things that you would use tactically and we, we, we sell them and we, you know, we give people information like that. So I would say, you know, your bear fund is going to be your short exposure. I'm not going to tell you to put it in your portfolio forever. I've got a couple of questions on that. And you mentioned just about the gear, the gear fund, for example, which um, from my understanding is uh, an ETF that is internally geared that allows investors to gain leverage. Why, why did you say that you think more investors should look at that in a, a, with a longer term lens than than currently do? Why do you well, have that viewpoint? I guess my viewpoint, and I'll you know with all with all the disclosures about not giving investment advice, we all borrow money to buy houses, and we do that because in the long run, you know, in the past, houses have gone up more quickly than uh, you know than the cost of borrowing, and also it allows us to get that exposure. Um, you know, when we before we have the the full amount we need to buy a house. So when you think about equities, I always talk about sensible gearing. So don't go and throw all your money into a geared product where you can lose more than you put in. But if you want to buy, you know, if you've got a hundred dollars and you want to buy a hundred dollars worth of equities, you can do that. That's ungeared. But if you want a bit of diversification, you could take $100 and put 50 into a geared product, which will give you approximately $100 of exposure, and put 50 into a fixed income product, which will give you some diversification on top of it. So your, your $100 is at work. The other thing with geared products, if you want to be sensible, is don't look at them as a one-off. Because if you bought in February this year, the markets fell, that product would have lost you know, well over 50%. You have, to, you have to think about putting small amounts in over time if you're going to do it in the, in the longer term. So you, you put some in in February, markets dropped, you put some in in March when they're at the bottom, they're going up. So you'll, you'll get that sort of averaging effect. There's so uh, many behavioral um, issues there that I think we need to unpack, which um, we'll do shortly. The universe of ETFs that you talk about and the 50 plus ETFs that you uh, currently have, and you talk about shop like a shopping center or a grocery store aisle, wherever's empty, you want to pack that. I think about financial markets and the advisory community. So, whether you know, investment advisors, wealth managers, stockbrokers, etc., you would know this as well as I do, Roger. Decades ago, in fact, not even not decades ago. Uh, the the whole game plan was picking which stocks are going to do really well, uh, which stocks are going to outperform, and there would generally be a narrative around why someone, an end investor, would buy a particular stock. Mm-hmm. Now, we've gone a long way since then, and one can safely say that there was probably and still continues to be quite a bit of speculation in, in that space in buying and selling individual securities. We then moved to an era whereby investors were more so building portfolios using managed investments. Now, managed investments and managed funds that are unitized are typically uh, more difficult to, not more difficult, it was more time consuming to buy and sell um, when compared to individual stocks. Here we are again, we're in 2020, Uh, You as one ETF provider have in excess of 50 ETFs. Any investor can play any sector, any geography, any industry, most currencies. Do you feel like or think that we might be going back to an era whereby investors, rather than now speculating on individual securities and stocks, are now begin to speculate on individual sectors? whether it's tech, whether it's cybersecurity, or whether it's pharmaceuticals, uh, et cetera. Had, are, we, are we creating a, an environment whereby we're making it conducive for people to be 
speculating with with money or do you think that we are now giving investors more options than they they ever had i feel like it's this double-edged sword and i'm interested in how you see the environment that we're living and investing in today that's a that's a great question and not the easiest to answer because i think both you know, as, as humans, part of our, our nature and our psyche is we like to speculate. You know, we like to speculate. That's why we we go to the you know take out lottery tickets or we you know have a have a wager on something. And markets are often seen as a vehicle for speculating. And if you understand you're speculating, there's nothing wrong with that. And then of course, markets are also a great investment vehicle. So I personally tend to kind of segment. You know, my long my long term wealth accumulation is not speculating and I want things that are going to last and going to go up and ETFs are great because I know, you know, the NASDAQ is going to go up over time. I don't know what an individual stock will do. And in fact, the, um, the anecdote I love is NAS the indexes last, indexes persist whereas stocks may not. And if you think about NASDAQ, you know, Zoom, which we, we're all using now, went into NASDAQ in February, March. It replaced Towers Willis Watson, which is like an old style consulting company. So the, the index, the NASDAQ will keep going and I don't need to think about it. I don't need to understand. I don't need to analyze. I just know tech's great and all this new stuff's going into it. So that's my, that's my core long-term. It's gonna go up and the index does the work for me. And then if I want to, I can go and have a, a you know a, a short-term speculations. So I think oil is hot, or I think um, you know pharmaceuticals or food or whatever is is hot. I may yeah I may do that as a as a short term, but that's not in my core, and it's not with money. You know, if I, if it's a real speculation, it's going to be with you know the money that I could use to go and you know go to the casino or whatever. Not that I'm a big gambler. With COVID, there's a lot of people sitting and investors sitting on the sidelines with cash and not willing to um, take a position in, in markets because there's maybe a viewpoint that things are going to get worse or whatever the case may be. Why do you think, Roger, that investors don't put their money where their mouth is given that there are now solutions uh, whether it's via exchange traded funds or whatever the case may be, to back your viewpoint. So whether you think the market's going to go up, you can put your money where your mouth is, or if you think the market's going to go down, you can take a position on that as well. Why is it that investors, should they have a viewpoint such as that, that they don't take a position to back their viewpoint? Is it the fact that they're maybe not aware that, one can take a position to to back their point of view, or is it that the roller coaster is just really rough right now, and I don't want to do anything? What? How, how do you how do you see that right now with with what's going on? I think um, you know that that's a, that's a real behavioural kind of question and issue, and you know humans when they're in an un, in unfamiliar territory have a sort of fly, fight or flight response. So you know if you if you if you're approached by a bear, some of us are going to just freeze and the bear may eat us or it may actually then not see us because it can only detect motion. And some of us will run away and maybe we can run faster than the bear or maybe it's going to catch us. The same happens with investing. So, you know, when markets are stable and they're trending upwards, yeah, we, we get comfortable and you can, you can just do what you do. When you have a huge dislocation like we've done, we really do that fright or flight response does happen. So some people panic and they, they see everything's fallen over and they, they immediately sell. Um, other people go, everything's fallen over, I better, better go in and buy, you know, I better buy stuff or I better do something. So we get this, this fight or flight. And I, what I like to do, you know, and I, I try to do and I try to adhere to, and it's not easy at the time because you don't know what's going on and you don't know whether, you know, it's gone down 20%, is it going to go down another 20% or is it going to go up? Is try to construct hypothetical scenarios before they happen. So I, th I always think if the market fell by 20%, what would I do? Which stocks, or which ETFs or which themes would I like? And so you, ha you have in your back pocket a list of these things and if it falls 20%, you've got to be really disciplined and do that. 
Now, if it's going to fall another 20%, you know, in the, in the long term, I know it's going up. So, you know, when I, if I bought when it dropped 20% and it drops another 20%, you know, that part of my plan should just be to invest regularly because over time it's going to go up. Maybe I, I also have a little bit of a, a reserve for being opportunistic so I can wait until things drop, look at what's going, you know, is it going to be tech? Is it going to be pharma? Um, what is my, you know, what should I be, be doing? But I think you've got to kind of run those scenarios before they happen, or you've got to look back at the last time, so the GFC, and go, what should I have done during the GFC? How would I, if I had to play it again, what should I have done? Well, now we're kind of going through a, a GFC-like scenario, so try. And it's not easy because you're, you're acting in unfamiliar territory. And I think one of the other things to add is with the demographic of Australia and baby boomers trying to, uh, especially in a low interest rate environment, trying to um, uh, preserve capital is really important. And I, I, I totally agree with you that markets go up over long periods of time. Um, some folk just don't have that time frame as, as much as other, others would. And I think that's a really big factor to take into account as it relates to, to human psychology when it, when it comes to money and when it comes to investing. Mm. Um, Jack, Jack Bogle, and I, I think this probably wraps up this part of the conversation really well. He said, in, in times of market crises and market dislocations, he says, don't do something, just stand there. What do you think Jack meant by that? Well, I, I guess my sort of tagline to Jackson, I think Jack, Jack says it far better than I, I could, but I've been always saying it's, it's always better to choose to do nothing than just to do nothing. Yeah. How do you think the average investor can think through that? I think what you need to do is just don't do knee jerk. Give yourself a little bit of time to think about what you're doing and um, then yeah, do it as a choice. So I choose to do nothing now because I think there's too much going on. I think there's too much risk and things may fall or um, I choose to do nothing because, you know, for a reason or I'm going to do something because, so always have a, a reason for doing it and make a considered um, choice. The other is, um, you know, everyone feels very alone when there's a crisis, everyone thinks, you know, human behavior, you think it's, it's happening to me. I'm all alone. I don't know what's going on. We're all in the same boat. So we need to talk to one another. We need to talk to people who've been through crises before, and we need to um, focus on the fact that we're going to come out of it at some stage. So how do, how do we want to emerge? For those, and just back to your touching on your point, you know, those who want to preserve capital, these events are really hard and really stressful, and you do have to sometimes make, make hard choices. Um, Peter Lynch also said, I've got a few quotes today, Roger, so I'm going to give you another one. He said, in the stock market, the most important organ is the stomach. It is not the brain. How, how, do, how do we as investors separate the emotion and the rational, rational in other words, the irrational and rational? How, how do we separate that? How do we have a greater level of self-awareness to be able to, because it's very easy, Roger, for me to look at you and how you're behaving and the decisions that you're making. And it's very easy for me to uh, have some awareness about what you're doing and why you're doing it and what I think you should be doing. But when it comes to our own circumstances, it's, it, it appears to be, far, to be far more difficult to, to do that. Why do you think that is the case? And how do you think investors should separate rational and irrational? I think you've almost answered the question by saying, you know, you can, you can look at me and see how it's going, how, you know, what, what should be happening or going on. But when you look at yourself, it's all crazy. I, I find exactly the same. So that's where, you know, the, adv the advisor or the third party or the someone who's not you, who's not experiencing that emotion is very, very important. And the second thing I think is you make rules and make, don't make your rules in a time of stress. Make your rules before when, when we're in a, a normal. So if my rule is I want to invest $100 every month, 
when we go through a stress time, I should stick to that rule or have a damn good reason for not. So, you know, and if you look, even, even though we're not through the COVID um, crisis, if you'd stuck to your hundred dollars, you know, you would have invested before things fell, everything would have fallen, you would have invested, look good then it starts recovering and you're actually looking good. But when, when it fell and you invested, you were on the edge of a cliff, it could have fallen again. So that's why, you know, make rules and stick to your rules or have a very, very good reason for not sticking to them. That's, that's my- um, I, think, I think that's really important. I think that forms part of good planning that you can start thinking about um, worst case scenarios when times are good because you are probably far more level-headed than you would otherwise be mm. what do you think about roger uh products or investments that lock up investors money for periods of time during the gfc a lot of these property funds copped a lot of slack for this because they wouldn't release money and you know you and i could debate that for for hours i think do you think there is room in the investment universe whereby there are uh, vehicles for investors whereby their money is tied up for a period of time whether it's seven years or 10 years so it, it literally and does not allow you to execute on your behavioral biases or knee-jerk reactions that you may want to make when the market collapses do you think something like that has legs look again i think it, you you've got to choose your investments very carefully and make and choose your time frames so you know, if you if you go to the extreme and you look at you know long term early you know early stage ventures and things like that, the to, for those to be successful, they need long term capital and there's not going to be a return. And as an investor, if you're investing in those things, you've got to realize that it's it's you know you're going to put money away. It's going to be there for a long time, and you're either going to get extraordinarily well rewarded or you you know you you're going to to lose a lot. And it's a it's a it's a risk return paradigm, but where things like ETFs come in is you can invest in long term things. So you can buy any you know, a government bond ETF. We've got a, a long dated government bond ETF, for example. Now those individual bonds are long term instruments, but by packaging them in an ETF, in our supermarket analogy, putting a whole bunch of them in a plastic bag, you buy your bag of bonds. And at some stage, you may want to sell them. You can sell the, the bag of bonds to, to someone else. And you know, in the short term, they may go up or they may go down in value because they're a long-term instrument which will perform over the long term. But at least you have that benefit of if you need to get out, you can sell the, you can sell the plastic bag full of bonds where you may have trouble selling the individual instrument that underlines, underlies the investment. One to the power of 365, Roger, is one. 1. 1.01 to the power of 365 is 38. Compounding and small incremental changes over long periods of time, I believe is so underrated in our world and in our industry uh, and how investors think. Why do you think that is the case and how do we get investors to think more about this concept of compounding over long periods of time, because as I've just shown, it can make a, a remarkable difference with just one slight adjustment in a number. I think everyone should be watching your videos, Rob. Um, I think that's- Thanks that's for a, the plug, that, Roger. <laughs> no, no, that's, I, I actually believe that's you know, financial literacy. If people are, if, if we understand, then, you know, that, that's, that's where you start building. So my, yeah, I've got a 21 year old daughter and she's starting, you know, she's got, she's, she's part of the gig economy. So she's got her super, you know, small amounts that go into super. But we had a conversation where I said, you know, pretty much the same as, as what you've just said, start, you know, put it, put it away now. And you're not thinking about when you retire, which will probably be when you're 85, you know, the way things are going, but, let it let it grow let it do all that work behind the scenes and you know that's that's the power of compounding i think it all comes down to financial literacy educating people and having them understand the benefits of compounding 
my my sister's pregnant at the moment and she's due in February and I sent her a message last night and I said have you have you chatted to my to Deb my wife and worked out what you what you want for a gift and she said I get whatever you guys think I need I said if you don't tell me what you want I'm buying him a five thousand dollar parcel of shares and every year you're going to add to that and I crunched the numbers and you know, from zero to 35, I said, if you put away 35, if you put away $5,000 at 35, that child has close to $1.7 million, although in future, future value has close to $1.7 million in a portfolio of investments. And I think that will make a world of a difference to people, to their personal lives and, and to their financial lives. But it's just something that we don't, think about and people don't seem to think long term or long term enough uh, especially as it it relates to their financial independence or their retirement or whatever the case may be and I think financial education I think governments have a role to to play in this um, which we'll we'll touch on um, in a moment. Now you are a full-time academic in uh, mechanical and aeronautical engineering almost 40 years ago the at the time the 40 year old retired mathematics professor Jim Simons founded Renaissance Technologies hedge fund. He staffed it with mathematicians, computer scientists, and physicists to pioneer the world of algorithmic trading. And since 1988, Jim Simons' Renaissance Technologies medallion fund has averaged a return of in, ex- in excess of 66% per annum and has made over $150 billion in profits from the financial markets. Uh, Jim Simons, from what I understand, he's uh, worth over $23 billion personally as his share of the profits from his fund. And no other trader, investor, or fund is even in the same league for his returns over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, And in fact, his fund has created more wealth than the personal net worth of uh, Warren Buffett or Bill Gates. And I think the most amazing thing about Jim Simons, uh, his feat of mastering the financial markets is that he never took a class on finances, was not interested in businesses. And Renaissance hired people outside of Wall Street to work at his hedge fund. His team brought, I think, a whole new perspective to the world of trading by looking at it with a new perspective and through the filter of math and not predictions egos or opinions why are most investors roger not looking at financial markets through this same lens i think i mean the first thing to say is jim jim is an outlier so for for every for every jim there are probably you know hundreds or thousands of 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 failed gyms or or ones who haven't made it but i think he you know he was he was an early adopter so he was one of the first who brought the quant and engineering skills into the markets. And I think he's managed to create an ecosystem where he's able to understand the microstructure and all the, 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 the sort of the, the geek or the nerd stuff and adapt quicker than anybody else. So, um, you know, Jim, but Jim is definitely an outlier and most of us don't have access to, to Jim or Jim's technology or his smarts. But, and but that that's I like you know that statement you said about he's created more wealth than you know Buffett or whatever. I, I I would just bring that back to something that we can all participate in and say something like the Nasdaq has brought more wealth than Buffett. So if we'd all invested in the Nasdaq, you know, ten or fifteen or twenty years ago, the collective wealth behind that it's not it's not as spectacular as Jim's sixty six percent per annum, but it's much bigger. And so, you know, many more of us are able to participate in something like that. And also, you know, that, that wealth is, is, is huge, bigger than, bigger than what Jim's created even. Given your background, Roger, do you have a soft spot for quantitative and systematic based investing? And when you sit around the boardroom table, talking to your uh, friends and colleagues at beta shares or externally, do you feel like you got to sort of pound the, pound the desk a little harder to get your point of view across? Um, I have to think of, have to think about that one. Look, I, I do have a soft spot for quant, quantitative investing. 
Um, and there are some extremely good quant investors. I'm not, I'm not one of them. I do, I do understand and appreciate the process, but like everything else, you have to be careful with, with whom you select. And unfortunately, the ones you may want to select are not open. You know, Jim, Jim is, is closed, so he's not available to you and me. That's right. His fund is primarily made up from um, family and staff um, who I suspect are now quite well off. You, you, you talk about the NASDAQ having um, beaten, if you like, or accumulated wealth in excess of Warren Buffett's. Um, the one statistic that I think not enough people spend time looking at or have an appreciation for is that uh, of Warren Buffett's $85 billion, $81.5 billion uh, he made after his 65th birthday. Mm. And we all talk about how successful Warren Buffett is, but I, I just don't think we spend en enough time appreciating or thinking about the benefit of compounding over long periods of time because the, the numbers get so big that you, you actually can't do the math in your head anymore. You, you can quite easily do five plus five plus five plus five. But when I start to ask you to calculate five times five times five times five times five, the numbers just get so big that your, your, your brain power is not sufficient to compute that. And I think it's totally under underappreciated when it comes to long-term compounding. It, it is boring. And unfortunately, it's not going to make any headlines, but it's just one of the things that is a small uh, change that investors can make that have a, have a huge impact um, over the long run. Mm. Can we talk about COVID, uh, Roger, and human behavior? It's something that you've got a, a, an interest in, a background in, and, and, and you study. How, how do you think human behavior will change if and once the virus is eradicated in, entirely? I, th I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of obvious stuff. So um, I think the, and, and we're demonstrating it already. So I think the use of communication and the fact that you don't have to be in an office, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, uh, you know, I think we're going to, we're going to adapt lifestyle wise to a blend. So, you know, I like, I like coming into the office because I get the social interaction, the face-to-face -face and the rapport that you need to build face-to-face. -face. But I also like sitting at home because I can be very efficient. I don't need to communicate. I can take the, the dog for a walk in the middle of the day. So I think that's going to be a permanent, that we, you know, we'll come to much more of an equilibrium where we'll balance commuting and working at home. I think, um, you know, pockets of local entrepreneurship so local businesses, you know, near, near me, there's, a, there's a, a cafe started just before, you know, beginning of the year. And when COVID came, they turned themselves into a bit of a neighborhood hub. So right in the early days, they basically gave customers toilet paper, the, the sort of the industrial stuff they got for the restaurant. They started selling the, 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 the bulk packages of um, you know, flour and sauces that they used in their own kitchen. They started a bit of a neighborhood barter system and they've turned into a, a real focal point and a, a shop front and distributing you know, food and they're actually growing into a thriving business. So I think, I think the way we operate will start thinking differently. I think um, you know, businesses that have, I think they're great opportunities. If you want to start a business, now's a good time because most people who are starting a business realize they're gonna have two or three or four years of runway where they're not gonna be profitable. Well, if you do it in a tough environment, when you get out, you know, you, you, you've, you've been through the stress test. So you, you'll, you actually have a huge opportunity. So I think, you know, out of COVID, I think positives have happened with the way we communicate and that will, that will continue the way we work. I think there are businesses and opportunities for things that are local. I think on the global side, our logistics and transport, you know, getting, getting goods delivered remotely, it's amazing what you can order and what you can buy and what comes to your doorstep. That's all going to improve. Um, I suppose, you know, travel and tourism is going to change, yeah, at least in the short to medium term. You know, there's all these places in Australia now that I'm, I'm very eager to go and visit. And I think that's going to provide a, a boom for some of our rural communities. And 
yeah, at some stage we will get out of it, and I think we just need to remember what are the what are the good things that have come out come from this. How do we keep those when we get back and doing the, the all the things we miss? It would it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this all unfolds because certainly human behavior and human psyche uh, a lot has not changed for thousands of years. And you talk about the fight or flight uh, scenario where if you're faced with a in front of a bear and some are going to do one thing, some are going to do other thing. And it's just this natural reaction. And mm. you know, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about rational versus irrational behavior for decades and decades and decades, and some things just never change. So it will be really interesting to see how uh, the, this pandemic uh, will influence people as to how they live their lives and how they make decisions. That's right. Um, yeah. Even once all of this. Yep. Um, and I guess one other thing I should point out is, is I think a fo- what this pandemic has done is it's also given us a huge focus on sustainability and um, you know, partly because the world has slowed down, we're actually seeing the positive benefits, the positive environmental benefits. But I think it's also become, you know, come, uh, people have had time to sit and think and they're thinking, you know, what, what, are, what are we doing as humans that's really bad? And we're, whoever, you know, most people I talk to, at some stage, sustainability comes into it. And, you know, we've, we're lucky we've got a couple of funds here at BetaShares that are focused on, you know, ethical and sustainable investment. And I think that's an area, if I, if I had to pick some big theme, which is, a, which is here to stay, that's, that's going to be one, I think. I truly hope you are right, Roger, and I think time time will tell. I mean, I'm even going to say something, and it's you heard it first here. My long-term prediction is, if you look at these big indices we've got, like MSCI and um, Standard and Poor's, they're big global indices, they're big global benchmarks, like the S&P 500. They are eventually going to have sustainability as an inclusion in those indices. That's my my prediction. You heard it first here. I haven't said that in, in any This time. has been recorded, Roger, and um, we'll, uh, it'll be time stamped and time, time will tell. When it, when it happens, we, you, and, you and me, will, <laughs> we'll be able to actually high five in the same room. <laughs> maybe, in, maybe in real life. Um, one of the biggest issues in Australia, Roger, is the looming retirement crisis. And this is something that you've written publicly to government, to Treasury. You have voiced your opinion, uh, I think, quite well uh, uh, over certainly over the last 12 months, um, research from the Association of Superannuation Funds Australia, ASFA, found that most Australians need close to $600,000 in savings to achieve a comfortable lifestyle in retirement. They also found the average single Australian needs an annual income of around $44,000 to pay for necessities while still leaving money for holidays and other leisurely activities. Couples would need around $62,000. That equates to an average superannuation balance of around 550 for singles and $640,000 for couples. Now, you talk about this concept of the retirement trap, Roger. Based on some of those numbers, these people are going to get caught right in between this, uh, this retirement trap that, that you described. Can, can you talk to us about this retirement trap? What is it? And why is it such an issue at the moment for for Australians and 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 for government? Sure, and I'm I'm very passionate about this, so interrupt me and tell me to to stop if I'm going on for too long. But um, the first thing I have to say is globally, Australia actually has an extremely good retirement system. So if you look at all the the metrics compared to you know countries over the world, we do put a lot of money into our our super system, and we do punch above our weight as a country. So what I'm talking about are ways we can improve the system. So a good system is a system which has a safety net. We have that, we have the pension, and then allows people to start accumulating to fund their retirement to, to give themselves something above the pension. And we, you know, we, we have that in essence. But the trouble with our system is the way it works, we, we have a pension which has an assets test and an income test. And that has some very um, negative unintended consequences. So the government mandates, if you, you know, when you're in retirement, you have to spend a minimum amount on your, of your super or your pension. And a lot of retirees take that minimum to be the trajectory that they should spend. 
Now, if you're withdrawing from your pension at the minimum rate, if you're sorry, you've withdrawing from your super at the minimum rate and you're in that band from $600,000 down, roughly, you're probably receiving half pension. So you might be getting three quarters of your income from super and a quarter from pension or whatever. And unfortunately, you're in a zone where there's an income test. So if your income goes up by a dollar, your pension will reduce by 50 cents. And that looks like you're being taxed suddenly at 50%. 50%. So you're in the, the lower sort of demographic when it comes to earnings, and you're only earning an extra dollar and you're losing 50 cents. That's a very you know, bad way to encourage people to try and earn more and become more and more self-sufficient. So that's, that's what we've called the retirement trap. Now there's, there's kind of two ways to get out of the retirement trap. And unfortunately, neither of them are, well, one of them's not pretty. One just says spend more. And that, that means you'll end up getting the benefit of your, your additional income or whatever quickly, but then you'll, you, you have more risk that you'll end up on the pension. And the other says invest to get higher returns to pull yourself out the other end so that you're not, you're not in this sort of trap zone. And that's, that means taking risk, which is, again, what you don't want to do in retirement. So um, I can talk about our proposed solution if you want me to. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. That before we go to the, the proposed solution or what you think the solution for this is, is a retirement trap a certain, is it almost like a black hole where you enter it when you're in this certain financial position and then you're out of it after another position? Or it, does it, is it spread across the, the entire spectrum, Roger? It, it, it affects people who are mostly in the, um, I forget the exact numbers, but it's where you're, it, as a single person, where you're between about, um, I think, a, sort of $100,000 and $400,000 in, in, in assets, i.e. super. And once you get above that, you're, you're less. You're getting less pension, or you're not getting any pension, so you're not reliant. You're not going to be in the trap. And if you're below the bottom amount, you're being supported largely by the pension, so you don't feel the effect. So unfortunately, there's a huge rump of people in that zone. And um, so to get to get out of it, they really need to be withdrawing more from their super than these minimums, because that 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 then um, does give them the extra income to to not feel the effects of the trap. So that severe. then depletes their asset base really of quickly. Of course, though. they will yeah. deplete their asset base more quickly. So Roger, you're, you've studied this for a long time. What, 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 what is your proposal to Treasury and to government to um, help solve this crisis? Look, um, I'll try to explain it very quickly and it probably, probably won't, be, uh, won't do it justice in this short period. But the, the basic framework we, we came, we, we're sort of looking at is saying, let's make the system a lot simpler. And we'll do that by making the pension universal. So every single Australian will be entitled to a pension. And by doing that, I'm not saying the government has to give more money to every single Australian. What we're saying is, instead of having a pension with these complicated assets and income tests, we'll entitle every Australian to the pension and what we'll do is we should restructure the superannuation system so that when you start putting money into the super system, and even if you're doing it when you first start your job at age 18 or 21, some of your money goes into a defined um, contribution scheme exactly as it does today for most of us. And some of that money is streamed into a defined benefit scheme, which goes to funding the pension you'll get in the future. And by taking money from the super system, putting it into a big pool scheme, which will it, ultimately that scheme will provide the pension to most Australians. The government will still be required to top up for those who don't have the, um, the resources, which they're doing anyway. And suddenly you remove the whole retirement trap, you align the system so that increased income is increased income. And you can probably run a more efficient, lower cost system to get a yeah, a better outcome than we have today. You're describing almost a, a back to the future kind of event where defined benefit schemes were um, quite popular. Uh, and in fact, we've seen them largely, most of them are all gone now. Why, why were we doing them and we stopped them and now you're proposing we go back to some sort of defined benefit scheme? 
Yeah. I mean, the, the, the pluses of a defined benefit scheme is you know what you get for life. So the, the minuses are defined benefit schemes only work when they run well and they run as pooled schemes because you know, longevity is, is, is a, you know, fits a curve and it's different for any one of us. So those who have long life terms are being subsidized by those who have short terms. So as a, as a, um, a super system, you're putting a, you're putting a you know, longevity risk into the system and that's not easy. But I believe with the technology we have, with the understanding of long-term investments and for investing for long-term, and the fact that the Australian super industry is reasonably sophisticated, we can run best of breed defined benefit schemes. So I'm not saying, what. Well, so I guess what I'm saying is some of our money should go back into these schemes and they should be done on a, on a, you know, a big scale, pooled, high technology, well benchmarked, low fees, et cetera, et cetera. But, the rump will still be in a defined contribution type scheme, which is what we have today. Have you worked out what the optimal allocation is? So if someone's got a million dollars in super, what proportion of that as a percentage would remain in the, the, the original superannuation framework and what proportion would go to this defined benefit pool? This is ongoing work. So I've been working with the Monash Uni Centre for um, Financial Research and we're trying, <clears throat> excuse me, at the moment to get some actuaries to help us to actually model this out, to work out what's the, what's the optimum trajectory to, to do that. No optimal number yet, Roger? Afraid not, no. <laughs> Why do you think Australians, Australians are quite wealthy when, it, when you look at their, their total assets and one of the things that are excluded is, is the family home. And property in Australia has done quite well for for majority of people. Why do you think Australians are reluctant to realise the value of their asset being their family home in order to allow them to have um, greater liquidity and allow them to do the things they that they want to do? It is part of it because they end up getting taxed fifty percent effectively, as you describe. What's your take on that? I think my take and, um, is that the, the family home, you know, part of it's a cultural thing. So we, we look at the family home as, our, you know, as our, our kind of core asset and it's the thing that we're going to pass on to the next generation and the tax system reinforces it by making the, um, the family home an exempt asset. And there's a group of, um, in, the, in the recent retirement income view, review where we had this universal pension proposal, there's a, another group of, um, of, of, of stakeholders who are proposing something similar. So create a universal pension and they're actually saying, put the, house, put the home into the assets test and change some of the way things are taxed. So where we're saying fund the pension out of your, your super contributions, they're also saying fund it by putting the home into the assets base and putting a, a, a tax on some of the, the money that goes into super. And I think the ultimate system will, will, you know, if we change, will probably be a hybrid of these, these sort of measures. One of the things that the uh, US government, from what I understand, is doing is providing certain uh, households and families under certain thresholds um, kickstart money that allows them to invest. And I think the government mandates, I think it's $3,000 US, that money then gets invested <clears throat> I think it's a great concept, but where they invest the money is in long-dated U.S. Treasuries, <laughs> which we all know uh, isn't uh, isn't giving much of a return uh, at at the moment. But that then allows those folk to then draw on that asset down the track when they're older for uh, you know whether it's I think it's education or to help provide housing or something something like that. How do you think that type of system could work in Australia, where governments invest on the front end? rather than having to fork out for people at the back end of their working life? I think that's what our super system is meant to do. So I would, I would say, you know, I don't, I, I don't want the system to become more complicated with more and more pockets of, of, of sort of complexity or difference. But I think, you know, largely we have, some, you know, our super system is so much better than the US, the, the sort of the, the 401k and the you know, accumulation schemes they have there. So 
One final question for you, Roger. We're sitting in the year 2023. What is the biggest regret that investors have with something they did or did not do uh, in the past three years? I would say, yeah, stack, stick to your rules and have kept just buying the good quality index type funds, ETFs through the whole process and get that benefit of, of compounding of the, of the growth that we'll see by then. I think it's totally underrated and underappreciated. It's not sexy, but um, hopefully more and more people start taking a leaf out of this book. Roger Cohen, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me.